Welcome to the series of interviews with the pioneers of cardiothoracic surgery. My name is Leanne Harling and I'm here at the STS in Phoenix with Dr. Daniela Molena. Dr. Molena began her medical training at the University of Padova in Italy and completed her residency both in Italy and in the United States. She went on to complete her fellowship at the Royal Cornell and Memorial Sloan Kettering and was appointed as director of the esophageal program at Memorial in November 2015. Dr. Molena has a specialist interest in both benign and malignant esophageal disease and is a pioneer in the adoption of minimally invasive techniques and robotic, robotic esophageal procedures. She also has an interest in the development of novel technologies and image-guided approaches to further decrease invasiveness and improve precision of surgical resections. Her research focuses on identifying and measuring quality indicators to improve clinical and functional outcomes after surgery designing clinical pathways to decrease costs and improve results, and identifying racial and socioeconomic disparities in the access to healthcare. Dr. Molena, thank you very much for taking the time to speak to us thank today. Thank you. Pleasure. I thought perhaps we could start by talking about your experiences in training in two completely different health systems, how Italy compares to the US, and, yeah, and very, go from there. Yes, sure. Very, very different systems. And... Um, in Italy, um, all my residency really, um, uh, it's, it's more of an assisting and learning by watching and participating in the operations, but there is not a lot of hands-on uh, uh, doing surgery. And um, there's a lot of uh, difficulties being a woman uh, in a country where really there's not a lot of women surgeons. And I realized pretty soon, pretty early in my career, that um, I really didn't have a lot of chance to be like a, a real surgeon that operates. And that's why I came here to the United States first to do some uh, fellowship so that I had a better chance when I went back to actually be a real surgeon. But then I realized that, um, that you know, things really didn't change for me much. And so I decided to be, you know, make a big move and, and uh, leave my family and uh, move to the United States. And the training here was great. When I first came, and it was just amazing that actually all things that I've been watching for so many years, I could actually do it. And I just felt like a little kid in a candy store. So um, the training was amazing. I had an opportunity of doing a lot of cases of different varieties and um, uh, always been really passionate about esophageal disease. And uh, so then I, uh, here I continued kind of my path to, to growth and become a surgeon and uh, went into thoracic surgery. Thanks. And you've obviously overcome a lot of barriers during that time. What, what kind of things have you had to deal with in that experience between the two systems and how have you got to where you are? It's a, it's a, there's a lot of barriers as a woman first and then as a, a foreign medical graduate. Um, you know, definitely uh, as a woman, uh, there are some still um, some difficulties, uh, much more in Italy, to be honest with you, than here. I think here... Thanks to uh, women in the past that made it uh, kind of paved the way for us to be surgeons, uh, we are accepted as uh, surgeons. We're, we're not uh, looked at a di difference, uh, but uh, we are, you know, looked for what we value. So that's good in that sense. As a foreign medical graduate, you're always considered a little bit less good. And so... Um, you have almost to demonstrate and prove yourself more and work harder and to show that you really understand what you're doing and that you can treat patients and, and do a good job. Uh, but I found a lot of very great people when I came here that have helped me, that had invested in me, had believed that I could do it. And so made me, you know, confidence that I could do it too. Excellent. They saw that you had something special. Yeah. Um, <laughs> You, uh, you talked a bit about being a, a woman male-dominated specialty, and we've, we've kind of covered that. Um, how do you think is best for women to optimise their training? Do you think that you need to do things slightly differently to the, your male colleagues? I think, you know, in the past that women has uh, really tried hard to be, like, stronger or, you know, more, more than men almost, you know, work harder and, uh, you know, work uh, st stronger. And I, I think that the time now has come in which we can really be women and be surgeons. And I'm uh, very excited for that because we are different and uh, we should value and respect the differences. And, uh, you know, we have different values. We have... Uh, um, different skills too and so I think though that the time has come where we don't, as women can be women and at the same time be good surgeons and uh, so I look forward the future is going to be very exciting for us in surgery. 
Do you think you bring something different to the leadership role of the male colleagues? Definitely. And uh, it's good for male to have us around, you know, like yeah. to have a little bit of a different perspective, see things a little bit with different point of view and yeah. have that emotional aspect and uh, also the relationship with patients, but the relationship within the team too. Yeah. So I think that what men recognizes that now and they are actually valuing us part of, you know, the surgical male dominated group. Excellent. We thought we'd talk also a bit about your research interests and what your, uh, what your research involves. One of the things you've focused on over the last few years is, is providing health care for poorer communities and trying to enable those communities to have a similar access to health care as, as richer um, communities. How, tell us a little bit about that. I am very sensitive about the fact that uh, in uh, the United States, the type of care that you receive is very much dependent on where you go, which hospital you go, which doctor will see you first. And um, it, it hurts me to see patients that have, are not uh, treated with what is standard of care, or what is the best available care. And so I'm trying to understand why this is happening and how, what can we do to identify barriers and identifies also patterns of uh, variance and, and differences in uh, healthcare delivery. And how can we provide best care containing costs, because that's very important these days, but at the same time, you know, provide what is best available for patients. Sure. Um, and you're now director of the esophageal program at Memorial and you've pioneered quite a lot of change in the adoption of minimally invasive techniques particularly in esophageal surgery. Um, how has minimally invasive surgery affected your practice on a day-to-day -day basis? It's, um, I was at Johns Hopkins because before joining Memorial Sloan Kettering and uh, it was very exciting for me to start a minimally invasive esophageal uh, program. Uh, patients uh, you know do better when they don't have to have surgery with big incisions. And so it's, it's very exciting to see that we can do as good as an operation like we were doing it open before, but we can do it with small incision, which means less pain, which means more mobility. Patient can return to their daily activity faster. And so you can make a really, really bigger operation, a difficult operation that has a lot of morbidities, and try to contain those and reduce some of those morbidities. Do you think that you still get this, the same oncological clearance with um, minimum invasive to open approaches? I think something people worry about. Right. I, I think, I honestly think that maybe even better. You know, we, uh, with the, the cameras that we have now, very high definition, we can see very well. We can see the margins. We can see the lymph nodes. We can do a very good resection. And um, I, I, I'm pretty sure all data have shown that they're equivalent, but I doubt maybe there is going to be even a better result in the future. What's your breakdown? Do you do majority minimally invasive or is a selective group of patients that you... It, you know, I, most patients can't undergo a, a minimally invasive approach, so I try to offer that to all patients. Now, there are some situations in which it's not safe for patients or it's not uh, possible to do a minimally invasive approach, and, and then we do it in a traditional way. And I'm always very honest with patients that that is a possibility, but I wouldn't exclude it upfront just because of difficulties that might not be there. Do you have any absolute exclusion criteria? Um, no, not really. There's really no exclusion, absolute exclusion criteria, but I know by looking at the scans, by looking at the history, I know which patients have a higher chance of requiring unopened procedures versus those that are going to be a lot easier to do it minimally invasive. Yeah. So I set the right expectations with patients and I talk to them about, you know, what the options and possibility are going to be during the case. But I don't exclude it up front. Okay. Um, and how about robotics? Um, surgical robotics, particularly in, in esophagectomy? I think that, you know, there's a lot of new technologies that are uh, coming uh, to us, that are available to us, and, uh, and it's nice that we surgeons are in charge to understanding and uh, try to explore what is the best application for that technology. So with robotics, you know, we, we, we talk a lot about it because it's not very cheap. It's a very expensive technology, and which patient will really uh, benefit from it? But if we don't, if we don't adopt it, 
and we don't really become expert in it, it's going to be very hard to understand which patient will benefit more than others. And I think there are some procedures that we do robotic, robotically that we wouldn't be able to do minimally invasive with the video-assisted approach. Yeah. So if at the end of the day we can't offer a patient a minimally invasive approach using the robot, I think that that is worth. It's, it's, it's worth it to do it because patient will have less complication. We're going to spare money on the reduction on complication and reduction of the hospital stay. Uh, but, you know, it's not that robot is good for every case and uh, not that, uh, you know, we should use it all the time. Selection criteria again. Yeah. And another part of your research and your interest is on novel image guiding systems, interoperative um, yeah. guidance. Tell it's us. the same, same kind of concept. So I think that we need to use technology today to offer patients better uh, surgical resection. So there's a lot that's coming out now where we can actually um, uh, image the tumor, for example, and understand what the, uh, the margins of the tumor are. And so we can do a more targeted resection. And that might help patients because, you know, we might limit the, the degree of operation that we have to do, but we also might be able to do a better job just by removing what we think is cancer and, and, and leaving what is not cancer. Uh, there are options to maybe, uh, you know, especially for esophageal surgery, there's a lot of changes going on right now, and there are a lot of uh, more um, endoscopic and minimally invasive approach. And uh, by targeting your resection, by identifying what is, for example, disease and what is not disease, you might be able to offer patients, you know, a better quality of life. Sometime you might be able to spare the esophagus, you know, in situation where you wouldn't even think that was possible five years ago. So I'm excited about that, and I, I welcome all of these new technologies because it makes us a surgeon better surgeons and do a better job for patients care. And, and finally, if you looking to the future and looking at where we're going, particularly with esophageal surgery, if you had to say. I, there was one direction particularly that you think things were going. What would you, what would you suggest? Well, you know, I, of course I am interested in, in cancer and uh, um, I really hope that in the future less and less patients will require a big esophagectomy for their cancers. And I think there's going to be a, it's a very interesting area where we are going to be able to treat patients, cure them from their cancer with less and less um, uh, major or less and less degree of resection. So I'm excited about that. Excellent. Well, thank you very much for taking the time to talk to us. And it's been a real pleasure and you're an absolute inspiration. So thank you. Thank you. It was okay. a pleasure. <laughs> Thanks.